Hey everyone, Blake LaGrange here from Mastering.com. Today we're chatting with Curtis Wang, and in this video we're going to take a look at how he was able to demystify the mastering process and boost his confidence in his mastering skill set. Before we jumped on the call, we, you know, I was admiring your, your setup and your background. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I can to add personality into the studio. Right. <laughs> like pulsating lights on the machine. It's just, it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> For people who don't know who you are, what do you do? What's your genre of music that you're producing? Who are you? What, what are you doing? And just give a little bit of a, just a brief kind of description about who you are and what you do. Okay. So I'm a music producer in the electronic space. It's kind of funny because I kind of started out, well, I started out as a classical pianist. My parents were actually both piano teachers. So I grew up listening to classical music every day, whether it's like through CDs or my, my father teaching his students. But when I got into high school and, and university, I took an interest in hip hop DJing and turntablism. So that would be like the likes of DJ Qbert and A-Track when he was growing. And then I got into electronic music through trance. So that was like the golden age of trance music with like Armin Van Buren, Paul Van Dykes, Sandra Van Dorns, all the other Vans. Um, so I kind of became this jack of multiple trades, right. but master of, um, I guess, um, um, yeah, a master of none. But I kind of had my breakthrough moment, much to my surprise in 2009, along with some other individuals, won a remix competition. And one of those contributors was Zed's Dead. That was when they were just starting out, but we were just like a couple of schmucks in Toronto <laughs> where I'm from. And I actually decided to go back to school because I never took music that seriously. It was always something to do on the side, but I've always loved electronic music around that time as well as hip hop, but the, the process of music, uh, sound synthesis, mixing. And so that kind of brought me to where I am today, where I'm still trying to figure out if I want to be a hip hop producer or an electronic producer. I go by the, the alias Cacosaurus, but I also have two other, two other side projects because I can't figure out like what to do with my multiple interests. So I decided to sequester them into different artist names. So <laughs> cool, man. yeah, probably a good strategy. So yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So you're in the electronic world, Toronto, doing your thing up there. And so well, I'm now in LA. I'm now, now you're in LA. Right, right. I'm okay. in Los Angeles now. Yeah. Okay, right. yeah, got it. So that was your background. And obviously, it's very interesting in terms of just growing up playing piano. <laughs> so you're you're a natural musician, so you have that taken care of. So I've heard your stuff and it's all obviously very good. In terms of, I guess, let's rewind back to when we first chatted and you jumped on board. Um, you know, kind of, kind of rewind and take us all back <laughs> for everyone's watching. Um, where were you right before you dove into Mastering Accelerator in terms of your mastering skill set, in terms of your mastering process, in terms of the final quality of your mixes that you're producing, um, where you were in terms of just who you were as a producer, I guess just where were you before you dove in and what were the major catalysts to be like, okay, I really need to dial this in and try to jump in and fix this. So immediately before taking your, your mastering class, I was actually enrolled in the Hyperbits masterclass. Mm -hmm. It's worth acknowledging that because up to that point when I was with Sarek and Zach, I knew for sure I wanted to produce music and I knew, I knew for sure I wanted them someday to hit a professional standard. Even if I didn't become a music producer as a professional, I wanted it to be like almost indistinguishable from the Grammy level productions, which sure. is a high bar I set for myself, but that's kind of the expectation yeah. when you invest that much time and resources right. in the craft. So I was comfortably hitting that 80, 90% of the quality over time. And it's especially helped being in uh, Zach and Sarek's class. But at the same time, there was still that remaining 10% and I knew I had to bridge that somehow. And so it's quite a simple story, really. Yeah. Uh, they recommended you. Uh, and I thought, well, if it has the Zach and Sarek seal of approval, then of course I'm going to uh, take an interest in it. I'm going to chat with you. And it, it seemed to line up perfectly with the skill set I was missing to complete that 100% in quality. Yeah. Yeah, I remember chatting with you and kind of getting a picture of who you were and what you're doing. And anybody who comes from Sarek and Zach's group at Hyperbits is 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 usually a very kind of intermediate to advanced level producer already. So when I heard your music and I heard everything that you were doing, 
I was like, okay, dang, like Curtis is really good. But I agree with you. It was like, you have to bridge the gap of the last 10%. So it made a lot of sense for you to jump in because that's exactly what we covered. <laughs> so when you dove in, okay, so like great conversation, you dove right in. Um, I was so excited to have you on board. What's the process been like? And let's not talk about where you're at now in terms of your confidence level and what you're able to produce now, but just what, what are the mechanics of everything? What's the process been like? What are some aha moments? For you personally. So this was both a blessing and a curse for me. The, the fact that your, your class was self-paced was like, obviously the, the, the benefits are that anyone um, can take it at their own pace, whatever is most comfortable for them. So I actually spent a lot of time, but this was before COVID, I should mention. Before COVID, I spent a, a lot of time just listening to you speak, um, watching your videos during my commutes. I was taking the Metro. It was about an hour long commute. So it was a good amount of time for me to consume sure. each video and really just let all the content soak in because I'm not distracted by anything else. I could just watch it, uh, look out the window and it's a very nice, comfortable environment to watch mastering videos. If I, if I can be honest, yeah. I should have been more disciplined, honestly, about practicing with the files that you provided. There was definitely enough for me to, to practice with, but I think the fact that I was consuming all the content outside of the music studio, the studio here kind of made my, made that process a little bit counterproductive, but that was on me. <laughs> that, that's really on me more than anything else. So I could definitely have changed a few things there. For sure. Yeah. I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know in terms of like just the <clears throat> content itself, like as well as the Q and A times and interactions that we've had, what have you found to be like the most helpful or something that's been like, Oh, like that's a, that's an aha moment that I <laughs> kind of had or, whether it's your mental template or just met or like even techniques, what, you know, what, what's the rap process been like for you? So, so sorry, Blake, bear with me here. Cause my background is in, um, in education. Like I'm, I, I'm currently in grad school for education. So it's like my, my, the way I conceptualize the learning process might be like, hopefully it's not overcomplicated, but I kind of see my journey and my process in mastering.com in three dimensions. One is acquiring knowledge. The second is developing a skill set, And the third is, developing an attitude about myself as a growing mastering engineer. So in terms of knowledge, I'm so used to, like many other bedroom producers, I've watched a crap ton of YouTube videos. Fairly confident this is universal, but when you watch a lot of YouTube videos from many different content creators, you have a lot of information, but you don't really have a broader conceptual framework right. to organize it. And so if any, like if anything, whatever mental model ha I had developed is like a Frankenstein kind of thing. Uh. But after working with you, I realized that a lot of the information I've formerly consumed can be misinformed and it's, it's, it's incomplete. I can watch however many YouTube videos, how many hours, and I still don't know what I don't know. An example might be, I might be able to guess that mastering is slightly different for vinyl than for digital, but I can't really guess how. Right. But you came in, you completed that picture for me. So you, you kind of recalibrated my expectations for how much I'm going to learn and how much I have, I can expect to complete to be able to call myself a mastering engineer. So that's like the sure. knowledge side of things in terms of skills. I'll try to make this more, <laughs> more concrete. No, it's cool. So before enrolling in your class, I knew how to make sounds dynamic. I also knew how to make sounds loud. Yeah. But I did not know how to make music both loud and dynamic. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Which I think is like a classic. classic. Yeah, <laughs> so you probably heard it a million times. For but sure. not, only, not only do I now know how to hit that sweet spot be between loud and dynamic, yeah. I can actually quantify it now. Hmm. So like even watching you learn how to use a metering tool, was like open a gold mine of like, it was like a big aha moment for me because I severely underappreciated the value of, of metering tools. I can understand what the UI means. I know theoretically what RMS value refers to, like root mean squared, how do engineers derive the value and why it's a good indicator of loudness, for example. But I don't know how to turn those values into an actionable right. decision in mastering. But then you came along again, and now it's like, aha, now I know how to take that knowledge and turn it into an actionable skill set. So that was like of tremendous, tremendous value for me. One thing I kind of realized is that when you're speaking with people who are involved in the music making process, but in different ways, like you might have sound designers, you might have uh, performers, 
engineers, people who identify more with the engineering side versus artist side and vice versa. We tend to sometimes describe music colloquially with non-musical terms, like yeah, right. the sound is boomy, glassy, boxy, yeah. or crispy, or whatever. I actually struggle to come up with a better way to describe music than those vague words. And right. I guess it's because like our vocabulary is like hasn't reached that level of precision yet. Before taking your class, I can still kind of vaguely relate to those words, but I can't really do anything with them. But thanks to the EQ module, I now know that if a sound sounds like natural to me, I can actually translate natural to the 500 to 2000 Hertz range. And that alone was like of, of amazing help to me because it completed that framework once again. Right. So I think the recurring theme is bridging the gap from knowledge, right. not knowing what to do with it. And then now like doing something productive right. with it. Yeah. Applied, <clears throat> applied knowledge, action items. Yeah. I mean, the thing that you're discussing is that you're extracting from the modules and so forth. I guess you put it in really good terms. It's like, there's all of these understandings about words and stuff, but as you know, in order to be an objective sort of producer and engineer, especially a mastering engineer, you need to be able to understand that language and also understand the language of frequencies and bridge that gap. And so exactly. you've been able to do that. And because you're so educated through this and so experienced through this, you already had all of that knowledge. It's just like, okay, how do I apply this knowledge? In, in a very realistic way. And so that's been cool that you've been able to do that. So let's talk about where you are now. I mean, what are your masters like now? What are you, what's the kind of stuff you're producing now that's different than before you jumped in? I guess it's, describe the last 10% that you've been able to fill in and, and how much that's changed, I guess, some of the stuff you're producing. My masters have gotten better for sure. They sound punchier, they sound louder, and they've retained their dynamics. I guess this is just between you and me. I still sure. feel like I'm, I'm on my way to reaching that professional standard, but I still haven't gotten there yet because at the end, it's still, it's a process. Right. In the process of learning about mastering, there are so many dimensions to the learning process that in order to reap the full benefit of the course, personally, I have to go through the course at least like three times, possibly four times. Sure. Because like the first time through, I'm unlearning bad habits. Like right. I am unlearning my reliance on, let's say, isotope mastering assistant. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I'm unlearning the notion that learning to master is optional. Now it's like, it's non-negotiable. There's got to be like a dedicated mastering phase. So, so be, by virtue of that alone, my masters have sounded like so much better. I look back on like the first track that I posted on Spotify. I'm not ashamed of it because like, it's, it's nice to look back on how far you've come along, but there's, a clear objective difference in quality bef between that first track, which was actually not produced long before I took your course. There's a clear difference between that track and the tracks I'm releasing or that I'm exporting more recently. And I've hit the target uh, Luff's levels. I'm, it sounds dynamic. It sounds punchy. It sounds great in a car. I mean, that's awesome. Obviously, what, what is it that you're most excited about as you continue to unlearn things? And as you continue to relearn things and as you continue to learn new ideas as well, what are you most looking forward to in terms of applying this? Whether, whether it's your own music with these different aliases or, or whether you're just looking to improve on your skills even further, what is it that you're most looking forward to moving forward? Ultimately, I'm most looking forward to being able to call myself a mastering engineer. At the moment, I'm still in the phase where it's more of a verb rather than a noun. I master tracks, but I'm not quite a mastering engineer. It takes a lot of guts to turn a verb into a noun like that. Especially like when I when I get the notifications in Facebook and I see that so and so has posted a comment and there's a conversation unfolding. I would have formerly been intimidated by that, but now I'm a lot more curious. There are like leagues beyond <laughs> where I am right now. And I know someday I will eventually close that gap, but they have a lot of experience uh, that I don't whether it's because they've just spent more time on it or they're actual professionals in, in the space. It's been a joy just watching other people kind of model the conversations that mastering engineers would, would normally have and sure. kind of learning how to like talk the talk. I'm still in that learning phase. So sure. I'm, I guess, I don't know how accurate this is, but like I'm kind of an apprentice of, um, of the craft and I definitely look forward most to saying, yes, I'm a mastering engineer. I can take your mixes to Grammy level 
uh, quality. Yeah, I got it, man. I mean, obviously it's, it's, as you know, better than anybody else being an educator yourself, it takes so many years of practice and going through things over and over again and iteration after iteration, action items, kinesthetic learning, as well as listening and viewing. And, and I mean, all of these different elements. So you're well on your way there. And it's amazing that you've already seen all these cool things just within your own music. So that's exciting to hear, of course. I guess, what would you say to somebody who maybe has had a good conversation with me and maybe they're on the fence about diving in and they really want to try to understand mastering and they're kind of on the fence about diving into this? Would you recommend this to them? And, and what would you say to them? Would I recommend master like this course? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's no question about it. I would 100% recommend this, recommend this class. In terms of what I would say to someone else, so I, I believe I saw somewhere that your slogan for the class is you demystify the dark art of mastering. Like that's a very significant statement because yes, mastering actually is unnecessarily um, a dark art. And I actually don't know how many of your students are bedroom producers like I am, but I know that's, it's pretty common to come from that background nowadays. Sure. And it's fairly common as a bedroom producer who has a disproportionately high like dependency on YouTube videos and informal yeah. instruction. Right. That they need some mechanism or some way, some intervention to like separate the signal from the noise, like good quality content from bad quality. Unfortunately, a lot of the messaging out there is that mastering is unnecessary. It's optional. If your mix down is good enough, mastering becomes less necessary. You don't know any better when you're, uh, when you're a novice. I think taking this class, you have to go in with a lot of humility, but you also have to be ready to forgive yourself for not being a perfectionist and not expecting that, well, Blake said I should do this, or I saw him take a Poltec EQ and I both boosted and attenuated. So I can kind of understand at face value what he's doing to the sound, but to turn that into a consistent practice where like, yes, I'm going to also both boost and attenuate in this track and that track, like that level of intuition will not come to you overnight. Right. right. <laughs> you will learn a lot of tips and tricks and you will be able to re relate to it and it will make sense to you intellectually, but don't expect that <laughs> like newfound knowledge to immediately manifest as you are now a mastering engineer because right. it, it, it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of deliberate practice. There was a bit of a mental switch halfway through when I was like, Oh my God, like I'm not going to be the mastering engineer I wanted to be, but like, no, it's, it's there. There's a reason why people go to school for long, for many years for this. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all about taking these concepts that you understand intellectually, but then bringing them down into action, which requires new neural pathways, mental templates, which can only be carved out by doing an action. And so, I mean, obviously you're somebody who does that and you're very, very serious about it. And so it's all, it's just very cool to see. I guess that leads me to kind of my last question, which is, you know, you, you produce really great sounding stuff and very capable of what you do. And I'd be honored to call you an, a mastering engineer, no doubt. Besides all that, what's, I guess, one piece of advice that you'd like to pass down either to your former self or like somebody a few steps behind you? I guess the overarching one would be to, to trust the process and trust that you are in good hands. Yeah. Trusting, trusting the process with everything is always good. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, so I appreciate that, man. I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> um, yeah, I really much enjoyed chatting with you, man. Is there anything else you'd like to say or share? Uh, now's, now's your time. <laughs> so I have actually heard a lot of mixed messaging about the spirit of mastering. <laughs> that um, to some people, it's an art. It's more art than science. And to others, it's more science than art. At least in the first modules, it tends to lean more towards like the objectivity, the, the scientific part, which makes sense to me because at some point there has to be some objectivity in it. When I was taking the, uh, the Hyperbits Masterclass with Zach and Sarek, there was a lot more of an emphasis on art. So I definitely see mastering.com to be like the perfect complement really to hyperbits.com. But after taking this class, you will bridge that gap. Like you will not see mastering as a dichotomy between art and science anymore. It is a package of both where at some point you can't separate the two. That's obviously super encouraging to hear, but you are completely right. <laughs> there is this weird border between the art and science side of things. And that's like my number one goal is to like bridge that gap. So it's super encouraging to hear that you've been able to do that as well. I'm like one-on-one -on -one very committed, as you know, to partnering alongside you with your journey and whatever you're going to do, man. And so thanks for jumping on this. Thank you so much for 
for chatting and congrats for what you've been able to do so far. It's been really cool to see, man. Yeah, thanks so much. This is this has been great. Mm-hmm.